Welcome to the Battle of Edge Hill on 23rd of October 1642. What we see here is two months after King Charles has raised his standard at Nottingham. He's been amassing forces and what he's aiming to do is march from the centre of England down into London to try and stop this civil war before it even happens. The parliamentarians under the Lord Earl of, Earl of Essex. He is attempting to intercept Charles here. And this is at Edge Hill, which is in the middle of England. Uh, just south of the middle of England. And what's happened is King Charles and Prince Rupert on the cavalry wing, they have been standing at the top of Edge Hill all day. They're waiting for the Earl of Essex to attack, um, but the Earl of Essex is having none of this. And it's 3 p.m. down here. So the battle starts at 3 p.m. So it's a late battle start now. And what happens is Rupert who's stationed over on this wing up here. He has spoken with King Charles over here and between them they've decided to come down the hill and start an attack. Which usually is not a good idea. Sometimes the hill is the easiest position to defend on. Um, but nonetheless, that's what's happened. And the Royalists are all under charge orders down here. This is what the scenario dictates the Royalists start in. And the Parliamentarians are under received charge orders. So let's have a quick look at what the tactics could be here. Let's zoom into this uh, wing up here. So this is the right wing for the Royalists and it's led by uh, Prince Rupert. Now I've also stationed King Charles up there, and the reason for this is because of the, the, the way the rules work in this game. So what's going to happen is these cavalry units on charge, they're going to come over these hedges here. Because they're on charge, they have to move at least one space forward in their turn. And what's going to happen is the units are going to get disordered. Now King Charles, every turn activation, every wing activation, he gets a free move, so he can actually choose to reform a unit here. And that's why King Charles is stationed with them. The, the Royalists definitely have the uh, advantage in terms of cavalry. I mean, Prince Rupert is one of the best generals on the field right now. He's got a minus two modifier up here. And his cavalry, they have a morale... Um, 7 and 8 compared to the parliamentarians morale of they're down here they've got a morale of about 6 down there so definitely an advantage for the uh, royalist right wing there if you look at the other cavalry ring it gets even better here so you've got all these cavalry units down here so we've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 Five cavalry units supported by two dragoons down here and these are led by Lord Wilmot who is not a bad general he's got a minus one modifier now look what he's against down here that's it that's the right cavalry wing for the parliamentarian forces you can't even call that a cavalry wing what you've got here is around 600 Dragoons. One strength point generally equals 100 men in this game. And then you've got Fielding. He's on his own. He's got 400 cavalry. He's not the most experienced commanders. He's got zero modifiers that he's allowed. Um, now I've got a feeling that these five uh, cavalry for the uh, Royalist side, they're going to make light work of this situation down here. So, what's happened? Well, this is what's happened. This is a central wing. 
what should have happened was Bedford was meant to lead this right wing. Before the battle started, he is notably absent from the field. A lot of the parliamentarian forces are getting some cold feet here. This is the first major encounter for them of the English Civil War. And they're thinking, do I really want to fight this battle now? So a lot of the commanders are having doubts, a lot of the infantry are having doubts. So what you got here is a few good cavalry units to support, but you know, look at the strength of these, 2-2, two, 4-4. Two, four, four. So about 1,200 cavalry there. Um, as we look at, back at this royalist wing. 3-2, three, 3-2, two, three, two, three. So... What's that, about 1,300 there. So it's about evens, but... You know, the, looking at the morale. Okay, these are on 7 morale. Uh, they got a good leader, so it could be an even fight, which we'll have to just wait and see. So I think these are strategically positioned quite well, because once the uh, Cavaliers have made light work of this right wing on the Parliamentarian side, clearly the Royalists will want to get behind the lines and start attacking all these infantry units at the rear, try and take some guns maybe. So we'll have to see how well the uh, parliamentarians can deal with that issue. So all the orders are received charge for the parliamentarian side. Um, the other thing to note just at the setup is that leaders can generally be placed where um, you like to put them. Uh, the only exception to this was for the parliamentarian side in this battle. The leader of the army, the Earl of Essex, he has to start with the Lords General's Regiment. And as I say, I kept the King Charles close to Rupert because King Charles is going to be used for reform actions over there. I have to protect King, King Charles at all costs. If he is killed or injured in this battle, it would be a disaster for his side and the, the war could be over before it's even begun and the parliaments would gain a clear victory if that occurs. All the wing commanders are important. So Prince Rupert, he's going to lead, lead the charge um, but I'm going to have to protect him quite well. The You've got Astley down here I believe for the uh, Cavaliers. He's, he's at the back, he's going to be leading, leading from the back in this battle. It's just too risky to put him in the front. If he gets fired on, he could be taken off the uh, the field, so I'll keep him in reserve. And Lord Wilmot, he's at the front here. The reason for putting him at the front is he can move his eight uh, hexes forward, and then all the other units are going to have to uh, follow up to catch up, so they're still in command. Because as soon as he moves out of command, all these other units are going to have to catch up to get themselves back into command. Not much option down here, there's only one <laughs> cavalry unit for poor uh, Fielding. So he's looking a bit precarious there. So that could be a wing commander that gets killed or captured maybe. Balfour, now his, uh, his cavalry units are actually down here, but I chose to put him up here just because the right wing is so precarious, the parliamentarians really don't want to be losing too many uh, wing commanders. And I think he's a bit more protected over here. And if anything goes wrong up here, he can help do some uh, actions to try and rally the troops up there. And for Ramsey, I've started him with the... Uh, he's with his own cavalry units, which is quite nicely placed at the back here. Now the... These uh, units here, you can see they're double, uh, double height. That's because underneath them, there is a 100 musketeer unit. So what you've got there is... Uh, it's not focusing in very well here. Let's 
made it worse. What you got there is 400, uh, 400 horse and as I say 100 uh, musketeers supporting them. So the horse can stack with musketeers um, but then the horse can uh, charge off if, if they need to intercept. So that's the setup for the battle and I will uh, do another video once we've started and we'll see how things pan out.